So what I want to talk about is automated integration testing with Site Prison. So as mentioned, I came into coding and development quite late. I work as a tester at On The Beach. But before I joined On The Beach, I'd never really experienced coding. I'd never really experienced programming. I'd done a couple of weeks of Java, couldn't really handle it. And then I come into a place that's got 40, 50 Ruby developers, decided to pick it up. Over the last sort of six months, I've really sort of taken on the open source, I won't say mantle, but I've really got into it. So I've tried to get involved with as many open source projects as possible. I've tried to go to as many conferences as possible, listen to new people, pick up new things. And one of the things that I picked up about three months ago was essentially becoming the lead maintainer for this framework, which was developed by a guy who used to work at a contractor at the BBC. He has not got enough time for it, so instead of letting it wither and die, I decided to pick up and try and develop it. Two things about that. The first one was that obviously I'm coming into a project that was developed by a person. So this, whilst it was an open source community, it was one guy who made it all. So immediately then you've got concerns about, okay, this is an open source framework, were there any code reviews? How many people were contributing to it? One guy decided all of the protocols, he decided how the code should be structured. So the first problem with taking on Site Prism was trying to get this open source feel, get lots of people giving their ideas, get people reviewing each other's code. And the second thing about Site Prism is that when you've got a gem framework that's not had an update for three years, and then you suddenly do an update, the first thing that people think is, ooh, what the hell's happened here? So throughout this presentation, I want to talk about three different things, really. Why, main issues and aversions people might have to automated integration testing, and then a quick sort of how-to for making a small stack. So, again, I'm trying to think now more from the developer why would I want to do this process. So, specs and unit tests cover enough. Specs and unit tests are fast due to the mocking nature of them, and there's an extra layer of maintenance. I've got to write a lot of features. I've got to write a lot of cucumber integration. So let's look at the first one. Specs and unit tests cover enough. The coverage will be identical if you do automated integration testing. You'll still cover the same code. You'll still test the same amount of functionality. The integration test, however, will cover the full functionality, not a mock functionality. A little star next to that, I'm going to reference that in the next point and show you a couple of key examples actually in the Site Prism's testing framework that are ran on itself. So in other words, the test that we test on the Site Prism framework. Specs and unit tests are fast due to mocking. Hands up, yeah, can't really argue against that. A unit test will always be faster than an integration test. I'm not really going to argue against that. However, one thing I will argue against is that there's always this perception that when you're running a feature test, whether it's browser automation, whether it's an API layer, that they're always slower than unit tests. Well, yes, they are, but they don't have to be really slow. They can actually be quite quick if you do a little bit of clever planning and also spend a little bit more time designing how you want the original framework to look like. And I'll show a little bit about that on the next slide. Extra layer of maintenance. So, possibly controversially, I think this is a bit of a misnomer. Unit tests do have less initial setup than an integration test because a unit test, you write three lines, there's a spec. You write three lines in mini test or in our spec, it's done. With a feature test, you need to create a stack, you need to create a browser instantiation, you need to do a little bit more work. However, going forwards, when you've got a big framework, so on the beach, the automation framework's got about 350 scenarios, and that we reckon it only covers 20%. If we wanted to add another feature tomorrow, we'd add the feature code, it takes five, 10 minutes, and the amount of supporting code we'd need to add would only be the bare minimum because you've already got that bare bones there. Now let's rewind and do that same analogy again, but with a unit test. So we've got 350 unit tests. We want to add another unit test. There's pretty much nothing that can get reused. You'd have to create a new unit test. If you, even if you were adding onto an existing unit test, the same amount of code needs to get written. So actually, when you're going forward in a bigger stack, extra integration tests almost become slightly easier to implement than extra unit tests. Again, going back to the second point, the unit test will always be faster. I'm not going to argue against that. So, specs and unit tests cover enough. So here are, apologies for the size here, two very obvious examples where we haven't got the coverage that we want with a unit test. So, typical one in our spec, we're expecting an element to respond to another method call. What does that actually test? All it tests is that you fire a method at some object and it does something. What does it do? I don't know. Does it work? Well, yeah, it works. But what does it work mean? You know, two people, you know, Bill Gates has a job, I have a job, I wouldn't say we do the same thing. So I think something like this has a purpose, but you can't just rely on something responding to something. And then 
One, one aspect of site prism, or the main aspect of site prism, it is, it's a wrapper around the capybara framework. So one of the things that we leverage is the fact that capybara is a huge framework. It's got lots of uses. So in a lot of instances, instead of reinventing the wheel, we just wrap their code. So here, we've got a lot of methods that simply wrap their code, but they actually do something. But what we're testing here isn't that they do anything. We're just saying that when we call our method, we want it to wrap the capybara method. So when we want to get the text of an element, we don't want to find the text. We just want to tell capybara to find the text. We, we, we want to execute some JavaScript. We don't want to execute JavaScript. We just want to tell capybara to do it. We're just passing the mantle on. So these type of tests here, again, they're not really testing that the JavaScript's getting executed. They're not really testing that the text is being received. All the testing is that we're passing it on correctly. So in these kind of instances, I would say that an automated integration test is actually the only test we really need to run. These tests have purpose, but they don't give you the actual full picture. For instance, if this JavaScript method was broken in Capybara, this test wouldn't flag it, whereas an integration test would. Apologies, by the way, for the size for the people at the back. I'm not sure how that will come out on the uh, image. So I mentioned briefly how to create a small stack. So with a unit test, you write one new unit test. If you wanted to create an automated integration test from the start, you'd have to create a bit of a framework. But actually, if you wanted to create a very small framework just to do the bare minimum, it's only three or four steps. And I should point out that for browser automation, that's not inherently, you know, you don't have to create a browser automation framework with Site Prism. You can still use Site Prism and classes inside unit tests. So the point behind this is that if you want to create a small stack, it takes you five seconds. There's a few ideas as well that I'm going to talk about in a second from the README document on Site Prism. But essentially, once you've added the Site Prism gem, all you've got to decide is what framework you want, so whether you want to do a browser automation framework, an API-based framework, or even just some classes inside a spec file, and then go from there. And I'll show you a couple of examples where literally I've, I've, I mocked one up in five minutes. It's not a lot of effort to create this. And I would say, going back to my earlier point on the slide, the misnomer about it's a big overhead to create this automation framework. It's actually a misnomer in the sense that you don't have to spend a lot of time making this. You don't have to get it to do bells and whistles. All you've got to do is the bare minimum and it will be really powerful for you. A few ideas that I'm just going to relate to is that when we create this site prism framework, what we're doing is we're creating something that is wrapped around a concept called the page object model. Apologies for those who already know about it. Essentially, the page object model morphs something that is a programming language like Ruby into something that looks like a website. So you've got a website, you can imagine it here, you've got a web page. The web page has got some buttons, it's got a filter panel, if I use the on the beach analogy, you've got some flight results, you've got some filter page, you've got a basket. All the page object model, model looks to do is to split those up into components. So you might have the banner, you might have the search bar, you might have the results. Using Site Prism, what we do is we then model those as objects. In Ruby, you model them as classes. And those classes might have some inheritance, those classes might have some descendants, and those classes might have some methods and some objects. Once you've done that transformation from you've got a website that's got buttons, it's got elements, to something that is a class, it has methods, all you then do is ask Ruby just to run the code. So actually, when you're using something like Site Prism, wrapping the capybara, using browser automation, providing that your website you're hitting isn't you know, a legacy service hosted on a piece of ancient architecture. It will be really fast. Furthermore, if you do a couple of quick ideas here, as I've mentioned, you can cache a lot of these items so that when you're running your second test, your third test, your fourth test, your 300th test if you want, the time it takes to actually spin up the original web page, which is often the heavy part, can be done in a matter of seconds, if not less. So suddenly, what you're realizing is that to do, say, 20 tests or to do 30 tests using this automated framework will only take a matter of seconds. Now, you compare that to running our spec. Yes, some, some unit tests might run 1,000 in a second. But going from running 1,000 tests in a second to running 1,000 tests in 20 seconds, it's still within the realms of you know, the order of seconds. It's not really going to make your job so much harder if you have to wait 10 seconds for a result as opposed to 0.1 second for a result. I mean, who here has ran a load of unit tests and been able to count how long it's taken if it's only five or ten tests? It happens so fast, we don't even notice it. So what I want to do now is just show you a couple of really brief examples. 
and I've hopefully got a nice white layer here, about how little code you need to set up just to do a real basic automation test. Um, what I've tried to do, even though I've got two classes inside the same file, it's just for reading purposes. So all we've got here is a basic object of the Google website. And you can see here there's very little information. So on the Google website, we have a home page and we have a results page. Now, because this was only meant to be a quick demonstration, the idea behind it is I'm meant to be showing you the bare minimum. And once you've built this bare minimum, you can build any number of tests on it. So with this Google web page, we've got a nice little clean DSL here. All we say is that we have some sort of element. That could be a button, it could be a, a checkbox, it could be a text field. We simply give it a name and give it some reference, usually a CSS selector, XPath's available, indexing's available, any other selector you want to use, Site Prism will handle them all. By default, it uses CSS selector. And again, we've got another page here. You'll notice here that we've got elements. The only difference being here is that Site Prism will create innumerable objects. That makes it really easy if you've got a massive page full of data and you want to take every single result that looks the same. This makes it really useful for things like web scraping, for instance, if you wanted to get a load of data mined from a result set. You can also use it internally to process all that data by using Ruby's methods to map all these objects into some sort of hash or object collection. The other thing I want to quickly note is that you can also create methods because these are inherently just classes. So you can operate with them as classes do. You can include modules in them. You can have classes inherit from other classes. We can have initialize methods on these if we want to make some sort of lazy loading or if we want some clever JavaScript to execute on these web pages. Then all you've got to do is, the way I've recommended it, is that we cache our objects at the top just to simply make the speed a lot quicker. Once we've cached these objects, we do a little bit of setup and then we can run some tests. Now, unfortunately, I was having a bit of an issue with the Wi-Fi earlier, so I'm not going to grace you with that. But running a couple of really simple cucumber scenarios here would take a matter of seconds. Because what we've done is we've taken the framework that we've been, you know, we've inherited, if you like, from Site Prism, created a really simple, clean outlook. And all we've done here is created two pages with the bare minimum that we need to do some testing. If you imagine that this was an API app where we wanted to do a couple of API calls, we could do something similar. Now, I mentioned earlier that Site Prism itself has its own set of tests. Now, I'm not going to run those locally because it wouldn't be very interesting. They would run locally because it's a local web page. However, I mentioned that if you do some clever tricks, you can suddenly turn what looks like a very big task using automated integration testing into something quite quick. So in true Blue Peter fashion, here is one I made earlier. All I'm going to read from you is the metrics here. So we've got 73 scenarios. So this is our Site Prism automated integration tests. There was 190 different steps that got ran, including browsing web pages, interacting with web pages, waiting for elements, executing JavaScript. And it took less than a minute, 10 seconds. In other words, to do a full integrated test scenario using a real web page, on average, takes less than a second for many scenarios. And it's worth pointing out that this number here can get reduced by nearly 50% if we simply made the JavaScript execute faster, which is just a quick PR, or made some of the weights a bit less. So the main thing that makes this fast is the fact that we've cached our web page. So in other words, we're not hitting an external service, we're hitting a local web page. But if you think about it, that's not that revolutionary. You know, we've had offline web pages for years. So all you've got to do to get something that's as performant as this is have a local web page. Well, if you think about it, when we've got local services like local API apps or even local web pages on a sandbox service, those are still offline services. Those don't need to connect through the internet. So you would get something that's as performant as this, even running it on your own services, be they sandbox testing, UAT testing, or even some sort of local service like an API. So, just to sort of come back to the original misnomer, to try and bring it full circle, if you like. One of the biggest arguments against doing something like automated integration testing was, oh, a unit test runs in half a second, this takes ages. Well, actually, if we think about it, that doesn't take ages. And I think that's one of the main arguments against it. So, if anything, I just want you to think that maybe next time when we're trying to create this whole suite of regular specs, and we encounter something like we found earlier, where we've got these type of tests which actually aren't really doing much. 
Swapping these for integration tests, or even not writing these at all and just having integration tests, gives us such you know, confidence in that we're actually testing that when I execute the JavaScript, when I run the method, I'm getting the right response. And that's about it. Um, in terms of going forward, one of the things that we really like is that every pull request and everything that's getting merged into this repository going forward will have full documentation. The readme at the moment stands over 2,000 lines. So if there was any way you wanted to use this gem and use automated integration testing, trust me, we've got an example for it. Um, but no, other than that, thank you very much. Some of the sample pages will be on GitHub soon. But other than that, thank you.